Welcome, welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about number bases. So I have a warm-up problem to start out with. The idea behind this warm-up problem is a classroom presentation where a student can look at any particular number. Let's say they look at number 10, and then they find all the locations where 10 appears. And without looking at the cards, an instructor would then ask, where is your number? And the student would say, my number, if they're looking at 10, is B and D. And then once again, without looking at the cards, instructor immediately says, oh, you must be looking at the number 10. So how does this work? So let's play this game with the cards covered up. Let's just say a student says, I'm looking at a number that's on A and on C and on D. The instructor can immediately say they must be looking at 13. Let's uncover and find out. So indeed, the number is 13. So 13 appears on A, doesn't appear on B, appears on C, and appears on D. So after we learn a little bit about binary numbers, we'll talk about how this works. So what are number bases all about? They show us a different way of representing numbers. And you might ask, well, why would we ever want to do that? Our decimal number system seems just fine. Sometimes for certain applications, different ways of representing numbers is better. So for example, if you only have an on-off switch, like computers, the binary number system is a nice application for that. There are other situations where other number bases are very helpful. So the number bases system that you're most concerned with or most familiar with is the decimal number system. That's what we call base 10. People probably decided to use base 10 over time because there's 10 things sticking out of our hands for most people. The base 2 system is what we're just talking about as binary. Let's play around with the binary number system comparing to the decimal number system in its counting. So binary number system counts like 0 and 1, as the decimal system does. But once we hit the number 1, there's no more digits to use. In binary, there's only the digits 0 and 1 available to us, whereas in the decimal system, there's digits all the way from 0 to 9. So once we hit 1, we have to use a new digit placement. So 1, 0. That represents 2. So if we keep counting, we increase one zero, just like we'd increase the decimal number 10 by increasing the rightmost digit as much as possible. So we get one one. So once we hit one one, this is kind of like when we hit the number 99 in our regular decimal system. We've exhausted all of the growth with two digit placements. So we have to use a third digit placement. And then we continue to count from the right and we increase. And once we hit that you know, first one, it's the same as when we went from one to one zero. It's just we have another one in front this time. And then finally we would count one 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 to kind of finish off the space that we have here. And our three digit placements are now full. So the numbers that we've counted here are three and then one zero zero was four, and then one zero one is five, and then six, and we've actually counted up to the binary number of seven here. So notice when I'm announcing numbers in a base other than decimal, I say the digit itself. So instead of saying 100 here, I tend to say one zero zero as the number you know, four in binary just so we don't get confused with, well, what is the number? Is it 100 
or is it 100 in binary? So it's easier to say the digits when you're working in a different number system. So let's continue to count up to 15. So the next column, we would start by using four digits. And then we would increase the rightmost digit. So we get a one and then increase that digit brings us into the second column of digit placements. And then we can increase the zero on the right hand side to one one. And then we can increase the one one to one zero zero. And then we can increase the rightmost digit again. And then we can increase the rightmost digit again and land ourselves in the you know, second column. And then finally we get one one one. Notice that the counting is really repeating itself. Notice that all of these digits that we wrote here are repeated there, just with a, a one to the left. So these binary digits that we just counted would correspond to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And we've completed our goal counting all the way up to 15. So we wouldn't want to have to count all the way up to really big binary numbers. So luckily there's a quicker way to go about things. We can convert from binary to decimal by using powers of two. So let's see how this works. Let's write down the number that's there. So one zero, one zero, one zero. And I like to write the corresponding power of two maybe in a different color, right close to the digit. So the corresponding powers always start from zero and they count up from the right. So the corresponding power would be zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So what we have here is a two to the power five plus no two to the power four, so I don't count that. And then there's one, two to the power three. And then there's one, two to the power one, and that's it. So we could calculate this, and we would get 32 plus eight plus two, which is 42. Let's try this one more time. So copy down the number, write down the corresponding powers of two, and then calculate the addition of all the powers of two that appear. So we have a two to the power seven, plus a two to the power six, plus a two to the power three, plus a two to the power two. And if you calculate that, you will get 204. Now, sometimes you'd want to go the other way. Maybe you want to convert from decimal to binary. And this is where you would like to write out your number as powers of two. And you'd always want to use the bigger powers of two first or as much as possible when you're doing this process. And it works the same if you're converting to other bases as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is just write down some of my powers of two, like two to the power zero is one, two to the power one is two, and so on. Okay, so with that list, let me try to convert 123 to its corresponding binary number. So I want to write out these numbers in powers of two. And I don't want to write out two plus two plus two or two plus four plus four. I can only use each power once and I want to use the big powers as much as I can. So the first thing I could, could do is separate a 64 out and I'd have 59 left over. So the 64 is good just the way it is. I only have to deal with the 59 now. So the 59 can be written as 32 plus 27. So now the 64 and the 32 are in place. I can leave them alone. Now the 27, looking at my list, I could write that as 16 plus whatever's left over, which happens to be 11. And now I can write out all my powers of two that I have and deal with the 11 that's left over. So 11 would be eight plus 
I can't plus four because that would be too much, make 12, but I can do two plus one. Now, every one of these uh, powers of two convert to a one in binary. And every power of two that I may have skipped, I have to write in a zero. So I did skip two to the power of two, which is four. I didn't skip any of the other numbers. So 123 in binary is one, 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 four ones, and then a zero, and then two more ones. Let's try this one more time. So this time I'm gonna convert 111 from decimal to binary. So 111 will be 64 plus 47. And then with the 64, I keep that. And the 47 becomes 32 plus 15. And then I have 64, 32, and then 15 will be eight. And then there's seven left over. So plus four plus two plus one. And I've successfully written out my number as powers of two. Every power of two corresponds to a one. And every power of two that I missed, this time I missed 16, corresponds to a zero. Now, if you happen to be using uh, multiple different bases in the same question, and you're concerned that um, you know, whoever is reading your work might get confused which base you're using, you can use a little subscript like this note is describing. So if you want to say you're in base 10, you can just write a little subscript of 10 or 2 or a different base for base n. Okay, so now that we've learned about binary numbers, let's think about the warm-up problem that we discussed earlier. So the cards that you saw there may have looked like there was just some random numbers written on the card. Now those numbers certainly weren't random. It tells the quote-unquote mind reader which binary digits you have. Now how do those numbers tell the mind reader that information? Well, it's a particular selection of numbers that's on card A, B, and C, and D. So on card A, all of the binary numbers from 1 to 15 that have a 1 in the first digit placement appear on that card. So card A is specially picked to have all of those binary numbers in, in decimal that have a 1 in that rightmost position and very similarly with the other cards. So what the mind reader gets to uh, be informed of is the number in binary. So all the mind reader has to do is convert that binary number back to decimal to figure out the answer. So let's scroll back to the uh, trick from before. So all the way back to the beginning, so for example, with the number 13, the mind reader would say, okay, that's worth one, and there is no 13 on B, so the person would not have said B as their card, but they would have said C, so that's worth four. And then D, the last card, is worth eight, so if the mind reader adds up those amounts, they do get the number 13 and that would work for any other number. So A would be worth one for the first binary digit placement, and B would be worth two in another example, and C is worth four and D is worth eight. Let's try a different number base. Let's try base five. Let's do some counting in base five to start out with. So we have zero, one, two, three, and four. Now four is where things get a little bit different. There is no digit five in base five. So we have to use two digits to represent the number five. That's the next digit uh, that we can represent with a one and a zero as the number five. And then if we keep counting, we increase the rightmost digit as much as possible. 
And once we hit 1, 4, then we have to bust over into the next column and increase the 1 to a 2. And then we always write zeros to the right-hand side. This is kind of like hitting the number 19 in regular decimal counting. Once we hit 9, then we increase to 20. We're doing the same thing here, it just happens a bit sooner. So 2, 1 would be next, 2, 2, 2, 3, and then 2, 4. And when we hit 2, 4, then we have to increase the 2 to a 3 and write a 0 to the right, kind of like 29 increases to 30. 2, 4 increases to 3, 0. So then from 3, 0, we write 3, 1, and that would be the first 16 uh, numbers in base uh, 15 in base 5, so we have answered that, that problem. Maybe we'll just count uh, a little bit further just to get to the next uh, digit placement. So we count 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 4, and then at 3, 4 we would count to 4, 0, and then from 4, 0 we would count 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, and then once we hit 4-4, four, four, there's no more digits to use. We've exhausted all the possibilities with two digits, and we'd represent the number, uh, it, this would be the number 25, as 100. Zero, zero. Let's see what multiplication and addition tables look like in base 5. Now, let's keep in mind that the operations are the same as regular arithmetic. It's just that we're representing the numbers differently. So all the rules that work with regular arithmetic will still work the same way. So maybe to save a little bit of time, we'll remind ourselves that addition and multiplication is commutative. So it's the same uh, you know, above and below that main diagonal. So we only have to do kind of half of our chart. So let's just save that uh, time. So zero added to anything will just give us that number back. Zero is the identity. And one plus one is two. And then plus one is three, four. And then four plus one is five. But we cannot write the number five in base five, so we have to write one zero. Now two plus two is four. And then two plus three is one zero. And then two plus four would be 6, so we'd have 1, 1. And 3 plus 3, that would be 6 again, which is 1, 1. And 3 and 4 would make 1, 2. And then finally, 4 and 4 would make 1, 3. So let's try multiplication. If we're multiplying by 0, we would always get you know, 0 back again. If we're multiplying by 1, 1 is the identity. It would just spit the original number back at us. It doesn't change anything. So 2 multiplied by 2 is 4. 2 multiplied by 3 is 6. And we write 6 as 1, 1. 2 multiplied by 4 is 8. And we write 8 as 5 plus 3 more. 3 times 3 is 9. So we'd write that as 5 plus 4 more. 3 times 4 would be 12, so we would write that as 2 fives for 10 plus 2 more, so 2, 2. And then finally, the bottom right corner, 4 times 4 would be 16, and 16 would be represented as 15, 3 fives plus 1 more for 16. Now let's try to do some addition and some multiplication with base 5. Now the really kind of fascinating thing about this is when we're doing uh, base 5 arithmetic or any other base, it works the same as in base 10. All the procedures are the same, it's just the numbers themselves are different. So I really like this concept as something uh, to you know, teach uh, future elementary school teachers because it puts you in a position where you have to 
almost relearn the same uh, you know, things that you've been taught in, in grade school to add and subtract and multiply and divide numbers. So it's good practice for our um, brains to think about how we learn this and think about how we might teach it as well. So the first one, we have 1, 3 plus 4. So I'm just going to write this down directly, 1, 3 plus 4. And I'm going to think about my column of 3 and 4 and add that together. So you can think about 7 in your head when you add these two together. But the result of the number 7 is 1, 5 and 2 leftovers. So in base 5, it's 1, 2. So if you um, add the next column, you would get 2 as well. Now, one thing you can do, it is a little bit slower, so I caution this sort of slower method. You could convert all the numbers to base 10 and then do regular base 10 arithmetic and then convert back to base 5 if you're com comfortable converting back and forth. That is a fair bit of a longer process than just doing the addition, which does take some practice. It's going to be a new thing for you, likely, but um, there is a, an, an alternative option which takes longer. I'm going to share one more alternative, and it's called Exploding Dots. Uh, so you may find some optional links on the uh, old Google machine uh, for uh, Exploding Dots. It's a nice way to re represent different uh, number bases. So what they do is they, they write down a picture, and in this picture they have boxes and they have, they have dots. So 1, 3 would be represented as one dot in the left box and three dots in the right box. So to be a little bit more accurate, this box here would be the 5 to the power 1 box, and this box here would be the 5 to the power 0 box. And if we're adding 4 to this, we would put 4 dots in the 5 to the power 0 box. And what you do is you collect all the dots that make 5, and you push them to the left in this case. You could also explode them to the right, and I suppose that's why it's called exploding dots. So there's two dots there and two dots there, and it makes 2, 2 as your answer. So we could do the same thing with the, the next problem as well. Let's do it in both ways. So I have 1, 2, 4, and 2, 3. So if I want to add up these numbers, 4 and 3 make 7, so I write 1, 2. And then 1 plus 2 plus 2 makes 5, so I'd write 1, 0, and then 1 plus 1 would be 2. So a visual representation of that. This time I would need you know, three sections, the 5 to the power 2 section, the 5 to the power 1 section, and the 5 to the power 0 section, and I would have the corresponding dots of 1, 2, and 4, and then a dot of 2, and a dot of 3 in the amount. So if I collect five of them and I push them to the left, there would be one more dot there. And now there would be five of them in the second box, and I would push that again to the left. So my response would be, as an answer, two and then zero leftovers, because everything got you know, boxed out in that second um, rectangle, and then there would be two in the rightmost box. So that's a little introduction to exploding dots. It's kind of a nice um, way of visually representing digit placement and like how much the digit is worth in terms of its corresponding power. And it would work with base 10 as well. You just have to change the base from 5 to 10 and the powers work the same. Let's try some multiplication. Okay, so in this example I have 2 3, 4, multiplied by 4. So 4 times 4, that's 16, and we represent that as 3 
5, so 15 plus 1 more. So next up I'd have 3 times 4, which is 12, plus 3, so 15, and I represent 15 as 3 and 0. And then in the last column I have 2 times 4, which is 8, plus 3, which is 11, and I can write 11 as 2, 1. So there's my answer. Okay, let's do one more example. So I have 2, 3, 4 multiplied by 4, 3. So this time I'm multiplying 3 times 4 for 12, which is 2, 2. 3 times 3 is 9, plus 2 is 11. So 11 is 2, 1. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8, and 8 can be represented as 1, 3. And then we have to multiply through by the 4. So first we have to bump things over by um, 1 power of 5 in this case. So I write a 0 in that placement. And then I multiply through by 4. So let's just cancel out the carries from the previous step. So 4 times 4 is 16, or 3, 1. 3 times 4 is 12, plus 3 is 15, or 3 and 0. 2 times 4 is 8, plus 3 is 11. So 11 can be represented as 1, 2, 2, 1. And now we have to add it all up. So adding up the columns, I have 2, 2, 3, 2, 2. So there's your answer. And you can see that addition and multiplication, or even division and subtraction, work the same as they do with decimal, as they do with any other base. So it's a really good thing to practice and learn and challenge ourselves with. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one.